Hello everyone, and welcome back to Transcendent Philosophy. This is Seth here, and today we're going to be discussing simulation theory. Simulation theory has always kind of bugged me. It's kind of rubbed me the wrong way. It's kind of like one of those theories that it's superficially plausible, but if you something about it deeply doesn't resonate. Something about it seems wrong. And so today we're going to be seeing if we can debunk simulation theory. The most common formulation of the simulation theory, or more accurately, simulation hypothesis, um, it was coined by Nick Bostrom, and it goes like this. 1. The fraction of human-level civilizations that reach a post-human stage, that is, one capable of running high-fidelity ancestor simulations, is very close to zero, or the fraction of post-human civilizations that are interested in running simulations of their evolutionary history, or variations thereof, is very close to zero. Or, the fraction of all people with our kind of experiences that are living in a simulation is very close to one. Okay, so what does all this mean? Let's dig into it a little bit so we can wrap our head around what exactly this argument is talking about. Number one, it says the fraction of human-level civilizations. Okay, first of all, What's the context here? What this is, this whole argument, it's building a metaphysical principle. So in any possible universe, that's, they're saying, if any civilization in any world, any universe, there's multiple worlds, multiple universes within potentiality, when these possible civilizations, when they approach human level, which is our current level of technology, and then maybe they become post-human, they get better technology than us, so in all of these potentialities, different civilizations are getting closer to human level, past human level, and then it's a fraction, right? The fraction of all of these potentialities, um, and what, what it's saying here is within all of these potentialities, which fraction of these potentialities is able to produce a high fidelity ancestor simulation? So high fidelity, high quality, uh, high quality, specifically so high of quality that we confuse it with life itself. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about simulations that are so high quality that we think that the simulation is real, right? So the first premise or the first, uh, the first condition here, it's saying that maybe out of all these potentialities, the percentage that are able to produce super high quality simulations is zero. That's a metaphysical proposition. Maybe within all possible potentialities, 0% can make good simulations, right? That's number one. All right, what is proposition two? Proposition two is talking about the interest level. So the first proposition is capability. The first proposition is none of these potentialities are capable. The second one is none of these potentialities is interested in a high quality simulation. Maybe, maybe these potentialities, maybe they can make really good simulations, but they just don't want to, right? So maybe as a metaphysical proposition, all post-human high-tech civilizations have no interest in high quality simulations. And the third option here is basically saying that the probability that people are living in a simulation is very close to 100% right? So it's, it's either nobody can make high quality simulations, nobody is interested in high quality simulations, or it's very likely that we are in a simulation. That's the argument. All right, so this trilemma, it tries to force us into concluding that number three is true. Uh, the conclusion that we are most likely in a simulation, because they try to frame it as if number one and number two are most likely false. They're, the way it's framed, they're trying to make it seem like it's unreasonable to think that no one will be capable of this, and it's unreasonable to think that nobody will be interested in this. And so they're kind of uh, forcing us into the simulation conclusion. All right, so option one of this trilemma, let, remember, option one is saying, what is the percentage of 
civilizations that have the capability of making uh, realistic, lifelike simulations, right? So, option one of the trilemma, it assumes that high fidelity ancestor simulations are scientifically equivalent to our current universe, in that all of our scientific discoveries could be equally explained by high fidelity ancestor simulations, which would be a simulation that is super realistic and mimics the life of our ancestors. If there is a scientific gap between our universe and a simulated universe, then option one is true. Option one, the conclusion being there are no advanced civilizations that can reproduce our universe in a simulation. And the conclusion that we are in a simulated reality is unfounded. What do I mean? What I mean is if, if it's impossible to mimic science within a simulation, then it's impossible to make a realistic simulation, right? We have science in our reality. If simulations can never pull off the science that we have, then that means that the percentage of civilizations that can make realistic simulations is zero because it's impossible because of the scientific gap. So uh, let's dig into the science gap. The science gap includes the quantum gap, the consciousness gap, and the brain gap. The quantum gap. Quantum physicists will refute the point in that nothing about the way our universe works at the quantum level looks like a simulation. Simulations require a function that is based on systematically ordered computing to calculate an image for how reality should be rendered. Right? If you if you zoom into software, there's a bunch of order. There's there's all of these little uh, electric gateways, you know, in the processing system. The electricity, it, it, it meets a fork in the road, and the bit is the operator, and there's a, based on the programming, the electricity will find a new path, find a different path, and it's programmatic to where it loops through all these different pathways in an ordered way until it calculates what it's supposed to calculate. But the problem is, when we look at quantum physics, Rather than finding systemic order at the base of reality, we find quantum chaos. Perhaps the simulation hypothesis apologist would move the goalpost to saying that these quantum, these quantum units, these chaotic units, they're being simulated and programmed to be randomly chaotic. But if this is the case, there is no guarantee that these simulations will randomly produce an ancestor simulation because our ancestors are the products of chance. Option one fails if this is the case, in that only a small number of random simulations will produce anything similar to an ancestor simulation, right? When we talk about ancestor simulations, what we mean is future humans create a simulation of ancient humans. That's what we're talking about. But if our simulation is random, we're not guaranteed to produce a simulation of ancient humans, we might get ancient dolphin civilization, or ancient alien civilization, or we might get just a universe of chaos. We might not get any civilizations because at the base of reality is just chaos and randomness. We're not guaranteed anything. The consciousness gap. There's no guarantee that we can ever produce consciousness within a simulation. The philosophic hard problem of consciousness highlights this issue. If simulation theory requires the production of conscious entities, then the veracity of option one rests on whether or not it is ever possible to create conscious entities within a simulation. If simulation theory requires advanced races from their base reality to inject their consciousness into the simulation of their creation, then option one also fails in that only a small fraction of simulated entities will be able to be sustained by an injection of consciousness as the number of conscious entities in base reality is not scalable with the number of simulations that can be run. So basically the consciousness gap, it relies on overcoming the hard problem of consciousness and learning how to engineer consciousness but we don't have evidence that this is possible. If it's not possible to engineer consciousness, then this option one just fails because it's based on fractions. 
you can create an infinite number of simulations. You can create all the simulations you want, but if you can't inject them with consciousness, then they're not real. They're not, they're not equivalent to what we live in right now. And the only way option one works is if it's possible to create a simulation that seems equivalent to what we're in right now. The brain gap. From neuroscience, we know that brains produce consciousness rather than mediate consciousness. Consciousness is not a phenomenon external to the brain. This can be proven by a variety of experiments on the brain. We know, for example, that when you damage the brain, it alters your consciousness. This is huge. If you damage different pieces of the material of the brain, it alters your phenomenological experiences and feelings. Damage one part of the brain, you lose vision. Damage a different part of the brain, you lose personality. Damage a different part of the brain, you lose memory. Damage a different part of the brain, you lose hearing. There's so many different things that are based on the material structure of the brain. So additionally, we know that when your brain absorbs certain drugs or chemicals, it alters your consciousness. You can have different states of consciousness. So consciousness, it seems to be like an emergent phenomenon of the structure and state of the brain. Consciousness, it even turns off when you're asleep or when anesthesia is applied. If consciousness is sourced externally to the simulation, or for example, consciousness from base reality is injected into the simulation, then we have a problem for explaining why external consciousness seems to be wholly dependent on the materials of the brain because the materials are generating consciousness, not receiving it. For more thoughts on the brain, check out the link below. All right, option two. Remember, option two is about the interest in producing simulations. Option two tries to pressure the reader into assuming that advanced races will be very interested in producing high fidelity ancestor simulations. But there are many reasons to doubt this assumption. The interest gap. The interest gap includes the cost gap, the video game gap, the why gap, and the moral gap. The cost gap. The simulation hypothesis smuggles in the assumption that simulations are infinitely easier to run than finding universes in the wild. It could be very possible that the energy resources needed for running a massive simulation are so costly that running large quantities of high fidelity ancestor simulations is just not desirable. High costs make simulations less desirable. The video game gap. There are a whole host of attributes that we associate with simulations. The most common type of universe simulation is a video game. If you examine our universe, it doesn't meet any of the attributes of a video game. Number one, we aren't aware of our original selves. Number two, we aren't aware of our purpose. Number three, our lives end brutally and arbitrarily without any narrative to justify what you did wrong and how you should change in order to win the game. And number four, there are no points. We know that humans have a natural interest in video games, but if our universe is not a video game, then where does the interest in massive simulations come from? The why gap. If our universe is assumed to be a non-video game simulation, then an important question to ask is why? Why simulate entropy? Why simulate consciousness? Why simulate an insane amount of empty space? Why simulate an insane number of dead planets? Why is alien life so rare in this huge simulation? I.e. the Fermi paradox. Why did they design it to be almost as boring as possible despite committing a seemingly infinite amount of resources to running the simulation? Right? A universe with tons of planets and no aliens? That's kind of boring, comparatively, right? Like, they could flip a switch and you got aliens everywhere. Like, if, if we're supposed to believe that post-human civilizations are interested in this, they're not, in, they're not getting anything interesting from alien civilizations because we don't have evidence of alien civilizations. It seems like we're alone. The moral gap. The morality of this universe as a simulation seems very suspect. I tend to think that morality is best defined in terms of collective meta well-being. Well-being implies a bias to long-term sustainable happiness over short-term self-destructive happiness. Collective implies that the well-being of everyone in the group is being considered. 
i.e. fairness. Meta implies that this is referring to a higher order agglomeration of well-being factors that include all possible psychological needs, values, in, to the extent that it resolves the conflicts between utilitarianism and deontology, it includes the need for rights and duties as psychological factors within well-being, so it's covering all the bases for what makes us happy. Morality defined in this way necessarily requires that something is only good if the benefits to collective meta-well-being outweigh the costs. Right? It's got to be a net benefit in order to be good. Collective meta-well-being is essentially based around conscious entities and their sensory experiences. When a simulation randomly tortures individuals with disease or death and pain and torture and crime, all of these things violate collective meta-well-being. It's a cost to collective meta-well-being. When a simulation randomly allows children to die from accidents, this violates collective meta-well-being. Only an immoral intelligence would design a simulation that randomly violates collective meta-well-being for no reason. That begs the question as to what kind of telos or purpose for the simulation is necessary to justify the morality of the decision to run the simulation, right? These post-human civilizations, when they run this project past their ethics board, right? What is the reason that, oh, you wanna, you wanna, uh, <laughs> You want to design this uh, simulation to have pain and suffering? Okay, why? Why are we? Why are we gonna uh, check mark this as a? Why are we gonna okay this project from an ethical standpoint? We gotta have a really good reason for that design feature, right? Option three. Uh, remember, option three of the trilemma. It's basically the conclusion that we are in a simulation. Option three of the trilemma assumes that with technology combined with interest, then we can conclude that we are most likely in a simulation. I believe this argument fails in the following ways. Probability gap. The probability gap includes the detail gap, the selection bias gap, cosmic dust analogy, natural versus simulated, manufactured rock analogy, Occam's razor, the law of non-contradiction, and thought experiment testing. The detail gap. If the universe was a simulation, you would expect the level of detail generated by the simulation match its purpose. If there is a gap between observed detail and the purpose of the simulation, then the probability of that explanation being true is lowered. Video games don't program atomic level detail since atomic level detail isn't relevant to the purpose of the game. Video games also don't program unnecessary planets. We should be able to posit potential teloses, or purposes, for the simulation, and then compare our observations against the telos for probability estimations. So for example, if the universe is a video game, then we would say that the purpose of the video game is if... <laughs> let's imagine that it's a shooter video game, right? The shooter is a classification of video games that involves warfare. Well, Earth has had a lot of warfare, so maybe we could posit that the purpose of this universe is a shooter game. So what type of level of detail is necessary? We need detail for the players, we need detail for the guns, we need detail for the projectiles, and detail for the environment, and but you don't need you don't need atomic level detail. In in shooter video games, there's no atomic level detail, right? There's no nobody has organs. It's the, the 3D character is a facade. He's a <laughs> He's, he's just kind of a balloon. He's a digital balloon, and often inside video games, you can cause a glitch. There'll be a glitch in the video game where you, you can kind of see inside the 3D character, and it's like empty space, right? It's, this, it's a hologram that has empty space inside. There's, so if the telos is a shooter, we would expect detail to match that purpose. We don't expect video games, shooter video games, to have atoms, etc. And so... That's the detail gap. Selection bias, cosmic dust analogy. Assume that the number of simulated universes is greater than the number of real universes. You could make the same argument about cosmic dust. Within the universe, cosmic dust is infinitely more common than organic matter. Therefore, when I open my fridge, I should see cosmic dust. That's what the probability says. The problem with this conclusion is that 
opening of the fridge is not a random sample of matter in the universe. The fridge is an entity that contains selection bias. We have already selected the only planet with life in the universe. We have further selected a home of an animal at the top of the hierarchy of life. And we have selected an appliance within this creature's home. These limiting factors make the result of opening the fridge incredibly biased. The contents of the fridge do not represent reality across the universe. Similarly, our universe is not a random sample of possible universes, including simulated universes. We are selecting a very biased sample from the list of all possible universes. This is the universe that we evolved within. Simulated universes will vary in quantity and quality. We know that this universe is not a 2D video game simulation, nor is it a 3D video game simulation, nor is it a VR video game simulation, nor is it a digital video game simulation. We know that it's not a philosophic zombie simulation because consciousness exists. We know that it isn't a small simulation based on the size of the universe, and we know that it isn't a low detail simulation because quantum details of of the universe are everywhere at the, at the atomic and quantum level. There are so many filters that have already been applied to our current universe. It's a, our current universe is very specific with all of these limiting factors that it isn't necessarily true that we could be having our experience within any possible universe. This extremely selected experience can't work in a 2D universe. It can't work in a different universe without atoms. So it's quite possible that our experience is only possible within this set of filters. And this, in fact, is a type of survivorship bias. It's a subtype of selection bias. Our data set, the only data that we have, is this universe. In this universe, it's the only surviving universe, or you could say it's the only universe we're aware of, and that is if you consider it the ability to carry consciousness as the trait that is necessary to survive. This is the only universe that we're aware of that has this trait. Of all the universes where consciousness failed to generate, these are not within our sample. So our sample, which is this universe, is not representative of all these failed universes within potentiality. There's a bunch of 2D universes that failed to produce consciousness, a bunch of 5D universes that failed to produce consciousness, a bunch of, I don't know, 1D universes, and maybe a bunch of 3D or 4D universes like ours that didn't produce consciousness either, and none of those are included or represented by the data we have because our, our data is biased. So if 99% of universes fail to develop consciousness, then the probability of consciousness, it's low, not high. If consciousness is rare in a natural universe, then it should be even more rare in an artificial universe, assuming we haven't overcome the ability to engineer it. If most simulations fail to develop consciousness because of this compounded difficulty, then it is unlikely that we are in a simulation. This issue is further fleshed out in the anthropic principle and has been equally applied to the issue of why we exist on a Goldilocks planet of seemingly perfect attributes for life. So, this is a relevant point, uh, selection bias. Natural versus simulated, manufactured rock analogy. Imagine if you took a hike and you found a rock on the trail, and then someone came up to you and told you, the fraction of human level civilizations that learn how to manufacture high fidelity rocks is very close to zero, or the fraction of uh, these civilizations that are interested in manufacturing rocks is very close to zero, or the fraction of all rocks that are manufactured is very close to one, right? This is a mimicry of the simulation theory argument, but maybe you can see the fallacy here, right? This argument, it seems plausible at first, but when you go hiking, would you conclude that the average rock on the hiking trail was manufactured by humans? No, you would not. Why? Because different types of rocks have their own probability clouds. It's a context in which they are more likely to appear. A manufactured rock is more likely to appear in a human's front yard, right? The probability cloud is more dense. It's more likely to be near a house. Natural rocks are more likely to appear in natural areas. So this analogy, it also highlights the issue with assuming the fraction of simulations to real units will necessarily be high. 
merely due to psychological interest. So what do I mean by that? The fraction of simulated rocks to natural rocks is not high because the quantity of natural rocks is infinitely greater than the human capacity to manufacture. Just because it is easy to manufacture rocks doesn't mean that it is easy or desirable to create infinitely more manufactured rocks than are currently naturally in existence. Similarly, there is no guarantee that it is easy or desirable for advanced races to create massive simulations uh, in, in a quantity that far exceeds natural universes. We don't know how many universes exist in total. It could be that natural universes are just as common as natural rocks on a mountain. Simulation theory smuggles in an assumption that natural universes are hard to find randomly, whereas they have no evidence that natural universes aren't as common as rocks on a trail. Occam's Razor. Occam's Razor reminds us that the more claims that need to be simultaneously true in order for a hypothesis to be true, the less likely it is true, right? The more complex it is, the more requirements, the less likely that all of those requirements are going to line up. The probability of two things happening together is calculated by multiplying the probabilities together. For example, the probability of one coin flip resulting in heads is 50%. To get the probability of two coins resulting in two heads, it's 50% multiplied by 50% re resulting in 25%. If you add a third coin, you multiply the 25% by another 50% coin toss, and the total probability is 12.5%. So the more factors that need to happen together, the lower the probability. So to run the actual probability of the entire simulation hypothesis claim, you have to combine the probabilities of each of the claims, having massive simulations, having consciousness, having a telos that justifies suffering, uh, having a reason that justifies the lack of video game original self-awareness, uh, a reason for the design apparently being boring and arbitrary, and six, a reason for making the simulation infinitely big, and seven, a reason for it being worth so many resources to run. When a significant percentage of the conscious entities in the simulation they hate it so much that they would rather risk self-harm and pain to self-terminate with suicide and maybe face an unknown hell or void just to escape the simulation. A simulation that randomly tortures those within it. Right? So, Occam's Razor. You have to justify all of these factors in order to make it work. And those are a that's a lot of factors to make work. The Law of Non-Contradiction. Additionally, the more logical inconsistencies inherent within a theory, the less likely it is to be true. The law of non-contradiction states that contradicting statements cannot both be true. People can try to solve the why gap and explain all the reasons for why we have this simulation, but based on my experience, most explanations for why are bound to be contradicted by some aspect of the nature of the universe. The more contradictions, the less likely it is to be true. The more gaps, the less plausible. So to make this more clear, let's get into thought experiment testing organon. An organon is just a logical tool to help us understand truth, an epistemological tool. Thought experiments are when you imagine a certain set of conditions, and then it helps you walk through the logical implications of those conditions. A thought experiment could be reduced to a formulation, a very simple formulation, if x, then y. Right? So thought experiment testing would be first figuring out your if, the, if x then y, and then subsequently go look for the evidence available and compare it with that y, and see if the evidence available is consistent with the y, or if the evidence contradicts y. Right? The y is the prediction. The thought experiment gives you a prediction, and then you go test the prediction in the wild. If the Y matches your observations in reality, then the thought experiment has predictive value. It succeeded, right? It matches reality. Um, if that's the case, then you might want to dig deeper into the thought experiment to generate more predictions for more testing. So, for example, if X, then Y1, if X, then Y2, if X, then Y3, if X, then Y4. 
if every single prediction matches observations in reality, then that gives credence to the plausibility of X being true, X being the thought experiment. If there is at least one contradiction, then X doesn't have full explanatory power. Perhaps X will need to be paired with an X2, right? Perhaps you need to make your hypothesis more robust in order to handle possible contradictions. Simulation hypothesis thought experiment test number one. Okay, we're gonna put this idea into practice. So the thought experiment, if this universe is a simulation that has the purpose of being interesting, right? That's our X. We're just positing the goal of this simulation is being interesting. Then we should find interesting life on every planet. That's our Y, that's our prediction. Predicted reality, lots of interesting life everywhere. But then what is our observation? Observed reality, there is lots of evidence that life, especially complex life, is rare in the universe. So what do we have here? Reality does not match the prediction. Therefore, this thought experiment test has failed. Simulation hypothesis thought experiment test two. Okay, so maybe our original uh, hypothesis wasn't a good hypothesis. Let's posit something else. If the universe is a simulation that has a purpose of testing human morality, that's our X. So instead of being interesting, it's, it's, it's testing character, right? If that's the case, what's our prediction? Then we should find that the entire universe is organized around humans and their morality or conscious creatures and their morality, right? So the predicted reality, everything should exist for the sake of humans and their morality. Uh, planets without humans should not exist since it's not related to the purpose of the simulation, right? If this universe is a test of morality, why do we have Mars? Why do we have Pluto? There's no tests going on over there. Why do we have galaxies millions of miles away, right? So observed reality, there is lots of evidence. Many planets without humans exist, right? Many planets without conscious agents, many planets without life. So this universe does not match the purpose that we posited. So reality does not match the prediction. We have a contradiction. Therefore, this thought experiment test has failed. And just a little illustration to help highlight the absurdity of some of these perspectives, right? As you can see here, this is the solar system. And here's the hypothesis. This Earth is God's favorite planet. And in the galaxy, out of all the billions of stars in the galaxy, this tiny little speck, this is God's favorite planetary system. And in the entire cosmos, this tiny little speck is our galaxy. And that's God's favorite galaxy. So it's kind of the absurdity of, it's kind of this self-centered, anthropocentric absurdity of why do we think everything revolves around us? Look at how big the universe is. Like if you see the entire scope, it's obvious that we're not the point. We're not the purpose. Whatever the purpose of this is, if there is a purpose, it's not us because we're a tiny little speck. So when we look at observed reality, it becomes clear that it takes quite a large amount of delusionally narcissistic hubris to conclude that the entire universe revolves around humans. This is an error of history, right? We thought that the sun revolved around the earth, but we were wrong. So conversely, a naturalistic view that things in the universe just naturally evolved to be what they are because that is the way nature works. This naturalistic hypothesis makes much more sense than the anthropocentric narcissistic hypothesis. Naturalism hypothesis thought experiment test number one. Okay, so let's dig into this new hypothesis that we have. If planets are a side effect of the Big Bang, things just happen randomly, and that includes random life. So that's our hypothesis. It's all natural, it's all random. If that is the case, if X, then Y. The prediction life would be scattered randomly throughout the universe at the rate of its likelihood, right? Uh, the likelihood of life. If, if life is easy to produce, it should be scattered commonly. And if life is hard to produce, it should be scattered rarely. So the predicted reality, life would be scattered randomly throughout the universe at the rate of its likelihood. 
And what is our observation? Observed reality is life is an unlikely phenomenon and it exists at a low rate in the universe. So we can conclude that reality does match this prediction. Therefore, this thought experiment test has passed. It has succeeded. It has accurately uh, predicted reality. So based on all of these arguments, my conclusion is for the question, is the simulation hypothesis plausible? My judgment is implausible. Well, that is the conclusion of simulation theory debunked. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, if you liked it, you know, consider subscribing for more content. Um, also, there's tons of stuff on my blog. Check out the links. There's I've got cut in the forums. I've got tons of content on all sorts of issues. There's plenty of stuff to explore. And maybe um, if there's any topics you like, uh, if you put some comments in here, maybe that'll be the uh, topic of my future videos. So really look forward to hearing from all of you. And uh, thank you so much for the, the listen. Have a good day.